The sodium HF trial assessing sodium intake in heart failure patients was designed to assess the effects of a low sodium diet on adverse cardiovascular events in these patients. And now that the study results are in, we are taking a look at the findings and what they might mean for our patients. You're listening to Heart Matters on Reach MD. I am Dr. Javed Butler, and joining me today to discuss the sodium HF trial is Dr. Justin Azikovic, who's the co-director of the Canadian Vigor Center at the University of Alberta and professor of medicine in the Division of Cardiology. Dr. Zikovitz is also the lead author of this study and presented its finding at the 2022 American College of Cardiology annual scientific meeting. Dr. Zikovitz, welcome to the program. Thanks very much, Javed. Pleasure to be here. So to start us off, can you give us a little bit of a sense of what did we know prior to the randomized control trial, just on observational data, the general sense of sodium intake in patients with heart failure? What were the guidelines saying uh, originally? Sure. So Javed, so we've been looking at sodium for over 100 years. Now, clearly, I'm not 100 years old. So um, lots of the data I had to review before we even started the trial, we realized that We've been looking at this question as a medical community for a long time for, pe- for any situation of volume overload. There's been large surveys of patients with in the general population with cardiovascular disease and even with heart failure to look at their sodium intake. And when we start to look at it across both regions and within countries, it's quite variable. But in general, the epidemiology shows that patients with heart failure, first of all, are consuming about anywhere around 2,800 to 3,000 uh, milligrams or three grams per day of sodium, depending on the region of the, the world. Um, this differs a bit from the cardiovascular, non-heart failure community, and also from the general population. The very three distinct sodium intake populations. We also were realizing that there's been a few very small trials early in uh, the study of uh, heart failure, and they've been met and analyzed with no consistent outcome. Guidelines started to recognize this and really backed away from very hard and fast rules around a recommendation because the the scientific background is weaker than anticipated and really people have moved away from that overall. So so that makes a lot of sense that the physiology of heart failure may be different than a general healthy population where low sodium diet is recommended. Were there any uh, clinical trial data prior to your study that suggested that uh, there is a potential for harm? And why did you choose to pursue your study? Sure. So there's nine or 10 small studies. Most of them have been very inconclusive just based on their size or their intervention. There's been a, a nice study from Mexico, which showed some potential benefit for patients as outpatients with heart failure with a lower sodium diet, less than 2,400 milligrams a day. And on the, conversely, there have been a series of larger trials that have been associated with uh, potential harm. And this was in conjunction with strict fluid restriction, less than a liter a day, very high doses of diuretics. And so it was very hard to tease out, is that a low sodium diet that's causing the negative effects, or is it something else such as the strict fluid restriction or the very high dose of diuretics? So when you put them all together, really no consistent message across the ambulatory care, inpatient environment, HEF, 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 REF. Uh, short-term, long-term duration. So we had a number of studies, but really very inconclusive overall. So, you know, there is really a a pretty global consensus that reducing salt intake as a primary prevention measure at population level is associated with lower blood pressure, lower risk of stroke, improve outcomes. Can you just tell us a little bit about the pathophysiologic underpinnings in heart failure patients and where there might be some concern? Sure. So this is a very complex area, and I just would uh, suggest people um, read a terrific article by Gupta et al. in Circulation 2012, which really lays out the pros and cons of a lower dietary sodium diet. Now, on the pro side is there is a potential to reduce the total volume of the body. That's a potential, reduce the diuretic dose, reduce the wedge pressure, um, and potentially keep people in a more compensated state overall. Now, on the con side that anytime we are reading the lower sodium diet, there's a chance for intravascular volume contraction, lower cardiac output, lower sodium delivery to the nephrons, and decreased renal perfusion. And these all activate the renin-angiotensin system. And so you can understand that potentially, that if those are the case, that those are deleterious effects, even for people on appropriate medical therapy. So the balance of those two 
means that we have to be a bit more thoughtful that it's not just as simple as reduce this one thing and you look at the one outcome that's only green. You got to look in the red side too to make sure that we understand both parts of that equation. So with that background, can you tell us a little bit about your study design and what were the aims? Sure. So we designed the sodium HF trial to be a very pragmatic, multi-center, multinational trial testing whether or not reducing dietary sodium in ambulatory patients with heart failure to below the currently recommended target would improve their overall quality of life, NYJ class, and reduce the number of clinical events. So as an m and trial, um, we looked carefully at whether or not we could reduce dietary sodium below a level that currently is recommended. And generally speaking, most patients in a heart failure clinic are recommended to eat less than about 23 or 2400 milligrams a day. And they've had that advice over time. So they've kind of changed their diets a bit. We wanted to test if lowering it even further to less than 1500 milligrams a day with using a, a very pragmatic approach of menu-based uh, system rather than a feeding trial where you get all your prepared meals. And we wanted to do this over a longer period of time. So we did it over about a year. So the patients were individually followed up for over, over a year. And we have a two and a five-year outcomes also being tracked. We did this trial in six countries and 26 sites, um, about just over 800 patients enrolled. And what we were trying to identify was number one, do we reduce the chance of all-cause mortality, cardiovascular hospitalization, or, or cardiovascular ER visits? That's number one. And then secondarily, do we improve quality of life, NYJ class, and six-minute walk tests? For those just joining us, you're listening to Heart Matters on Reach MD. I am Dr. Javed Butler, and I'm speaking with Dr. Justin Azikowicz about the sodium HF trial and its findings. I have to say, even before you tell us the results, a huge uh, congratulations and kudos. I mean, feeding trials are difficult to do. So absolutely uh, fantastic uh, how you were able to conduct this trial. So can you walk us uh, through some of the results? Sure. So first of all, the trial was stopped early, and I think people should be aware to that as we stopped early uh, due to operational considerations as well as the COVID pandemic, um, but also because the DMC had met uh, after the first 500 patients that had completed their 12-month follow-up to make sure that there was no other uh, efficacy or futility concerns. And they also recommended stopping it based on a number of factors. So we overall did enroll uh, 806 patients who were randomized one-to-one uh, for the primary endpoint, it was not statistically different between the two arms. And I would highlight that the lower sodium arm had numerically fewer uh, clinical events overall than the usual care arm. Um, that's important to recognize, but the hazard ratio was 0. Uh, 0.89, so but not statistically significant. We then also wanted to ensure that we had to reach our, our sodium reduction. In fact, between the two groups, we had reached a 415 milligram uh, delta or difference between the two arms of the trial. And that was appearing very early on as early as six months and continued on to 12 months. So the dietary sodium reduction was sustained, but the clinical events linked to that uh, did not change the overall outcome. Now, when we broke it down, we didn't see any of the individual endpoints um, that were statistically significant. So we then looked at our secondary endpoints to understand if there's other things we should understand about the data. When we looked at the quality of life, we used the KCCQ score to really look at this, and we used both the overall summary score, the clinical summary score, and the physical limitation score to really understand it. And when we looked at this, we uh, saw that the low sodium arm had a greater improvement in quality of life by all three different measures by about three to three and a half points. So that's a, both a statistically significant and clinically meaningful in terms of the quality of life improvement for patients in the lower sodium arm compared to usual care. We then looked at the NYJ class, and patients in the lower sodium uh, arm of the trial had a greater likelihood of improving at least one NYJ class compared to their usual uh, care compatriots. And so the NYJ class matched the quality of life improvement we'd seen, so a clinician and a patient, um, view different viewpoints. Then we looked at the six-minute walk test, and I identified that although there is numerically a greater distance walk by people with lower sodium diets, this was not statistically significant. And I just cautioned that we had very few people who were able to complete that at the 12-month mark, so that really did reduce our power to demonstrate a difference at the end of the trial. So what were the actual sodium levels in the two arm? And what I want to highlight here is to just make sure I get your opinion that if the primary endpoint of a difference was not met, does that mean that patients can eat as much salt as they want? 
Well, it's a, it's a loaded question and it's loaded with salt. Damn it, that's great. So let's first of all start about what was the baseline sodium intake for our patients. And they started off at around 2,200 milligrams per day. Now we did do, uh, three-day food records. We didn't do urinary sodiums, recognizing that on diuretics, their urinary sodiums aren't as translatable to a, a food consumption. So people were starting off at about 2,200 milligrams a day. Uh, we had people, who, of course, with a much greater in, in, uh, intake than that. And so that we'll be d- diving into that into secondary analyses. By the end of the trial, the usual care group was eating around 2,073 milligrams a day, which is about a three or 4% reduction over time. So really not different over time statistically, but the uh, intervention arm was eating about 28% less sodium. So we actually had a decline by about a quarter in those individual patients. So that is a I mean, clinically meaningful for any of us to reduce our sodium intake by a quarter is, is quite difficult. So they're starting off at about 2,200 milligrams a day. They're reducing it further. Now, when we look at our diets, such as if Javid, if you and I went for dinner and we went out to a restaurant, we're going to probably have 2,200 milligrams of sodium in that restaurant meal alone. So these people were making a change throughout their entire day and their lifestyle to reduce their dietary sodium. We need to recognize that we had to balance the fluid intake, calories, and all the other nutrients. So we actually only had the menu system change the dietary sodium rather than all the other factors that can come along with that. Now, in terms of what should we be recommending, I think that's really where it gets tricky. Um, based on the clinical trial, you could say, well, there's no change in clinical events based on the statistical analysis, so maybe we should just stop recommending it. I would say that that's probably not what we should pursue. I think there is still an 11% reduction based on the hazard ratio that's underpowered in the overall trial. So we have to recognize the kind of flaws in any clinical trial. We did see a quality of life improvement for patients in a lower sodium arm and conjointly an improvement in an NYJ class. So if those two things are very important as our goals for an individual patient and that as you talk to patients, I think those are still very important to realize that those are potential benefits of a lower sodium diet. Now, does it reduce clinical events? I need to then be a bit more mindful when I'm uh, seeing a patient in clinic. They ask me, will this reduce my chances of being in the hospital or ER or dying? I have to be a bit more thoughtful in how I answer that and saying, we don't actually know the answer to that question. The largest trial doesn't demonstrate that. Therefore, if your goals are quality of life and improving your your functional status, yes, this will work, but let's be a little bit more uh, cautious in our approach to it. Well, great. I very much appreciate your insights, both as a clinician and as a clinical trialist. So thank you very much once again, uh, Justin. It was absolutely a pleasure speaking with you today. Thanks very much, Javed. Great to talk to you. For ReachMD, I am Dr. Javed Butler. To access this and other episodes in our series, visit reachmd.com slash heartmatters, where you can be part of the knowledge. Thanks for listening.